Well, hi, I'm Jeremy, a sequels maintainer. Here to speak to you about what sequel is and how it can help you. First, what is sequel? <coughs> a sequel is a database toolkit. It's a collection of tools that allow you to interact with the database and build a solution that solves your problems. A sequel is not a kitchen sink. If you put in a little effort, you can build whatever type of kitchen sink you want with it. And the toolkit versus kitchen sink approach is one thing that differs um, between SQL and other Ruby database libraries. And there is one other main difference. Now, they say the picture is worth a thousand words, but in this case, it's looking for three. <coughs> SQL, at its core, is SQL in Ruby. Now, to understand SQL's purpose, we need to talk about the e evolution, <coughs> and specifically the evolution of database access in Ruby. Now, in the beginning, well, Ruby had no database adapters. But after a while, people wanted to use Ruby to interact with the SQL database, so they wrote adapters specific to each database, such as the Ruby Postgres adapter, originally written by Matt himself. And these adapters allowed programmers to use Ruby to increase their productivity, but they had a few shortcomings. For one, they were database specific, so code written for one database wouldn't work on another, for two reasons. The first reason is that the APIs were different. The second reason is that the SQL code was unabstracted, and differences in SQL syntax meant that an SQL that worked on one database might not work on another. Now, the database specific adapters operated at a very low level and required the program to write all the SQL out, which was often verbose. And finally, the op adapters offered little opportunity for abstraction, as they return rows as array or hash like objects, making it difficult to assign behavior to records. Now, in 2001, the Ruby DBI project was started, which gave programmers a standard database access interface. And while this allowed for writing database independent code, it still had some problems. It only abstracted the APIs, so the programmer was still responsible for writing database independent SQL. It still required the programmer to write all the SQL out themselves, so it was still verbose. And while it was more flexible, a lot of the users choose whether they wanted array, hash, or row objects returned, it still didn't offer the ability to easily assign behavior to records. Now fast forward to 2004, when Rails were referencing the Active Record and solved some of these problems. Active Record also offered an interface abstraction, allowing the same interface for multiple databases. And while it abstracted some parts of SQL creation, programmers still had to write SQL fragments, which led to database-specific SQL being used. Now, by abstracting some parts of SQL creation, Active Record cut down significantly on the verbosity inherent in previous approaches. And after record's best feature, in my opinion, is that it allowed programmers specify behavior of rows, allowing the rows themselves to do things. Now, this made for much nicer, more object-oriented code, as opposed to the procedural code that was previously common. Now, while I can recommend most things easier, it also came with strong opinions on how things should be designed, and it wasn't always amenable to disagreement. Now, in 2007, SQL was created to solve these problems more completely. Now, SQL brings the table more database independence by abstracting not just the interface, but many SQL syntax issues as well. Now, with SQL, the programmer doesn't even need to know SQL syntax, though they should still understand SQL concepts. Now, you might be thinking, how often do database dependent SQL issues pop up? And if you've ever had to work on an application that supports multiple databases, you know it's more often than you first think. And, for example, take even a simple thing like concatenating strings. The SQL standard string concatenation operator is the double pipe. The Microsoft SQL Server uses the addition operator, and MySQL uses the concat function. Now, the general approach to database depend depend independence using them in the library is to basically avoid SQL concatenation in the database altogether, and select all columns needed, and then do the concatenation in Ruby. And the problem with this approach is it's going to be slower, and it's not even always possible, since a filter may depend on the result of a string concatenation operation. Now, SQL abstracts the SQL syntax issues and allows you to write efficient database independent code. Now, SQL code is generally very concise, more than active record in most cases, and it's still easily repeatable. And SQL gives the programmer more control by making the decision about whether to assign behavior to records optional. Now, there are many cases where you don't want to assign behavior to records, and reporting is probably the most common one. Now, SQL does have some opinions about how to do things, and it tries to make it easy to disagree. Now, Matt has said that Ruby should be like clay in a child's hands, and SQL reflects this philosophy. It tries to be flexible so that you can mold it to suit your needs. Now you know a little bit about the reasons for SQL's creation, you can ask yourself, why SQL? You may already be using one of the other libraries discussed. It may get the job done. I mean, there's a natural human desire to resist change, to fear it. What does SQL bring to the table, and why should you consider it? First, SQL is simple. 
It's simple to learn, it's simple to use, with internals kept as simple as possible, but no simpler. Second, SQL is flexible. As I mentioned, it has opinions. However, it doesn't have dot com. Most options are easy to override at a very granular level. My SQL's toolkit approach allows you to pick which tools to use to solve your problems. And SQL's design allows you to use your tools to build more tools, which can be as specific or as general as you need them to be. Now, the ability to build your own tools is part of what makes SQL powerful. And the other part is that SQL's toolkit comes with some power tools built in. Now, in a day and age where other Ruby ORMs are looking like poster children for the American obesity epidemic, <laughs> SQL was raised with a South Beach diet and yoga. It takes less than half the memory of active record, and it starts more than twice as fast. Now, do you feel depressed when you file a bug report from the other guys? And it just sits, festering and rotting on their bug tracker? Because if they have a more is better approach on everything? I mean, how did you feel if you took your car to the repair shop and told them exactly what was wrong, and they told you to find three other people having your problem before they even consider fixing it? And wouldn't you rather get a response quickly from someone who probably knows how to fix it and maybe even fix it for you? And uh, what about suggestion improvements? Maybe you have a great idea and you're not sure how to implement it. Other guys will probably tell you to come back every morning and it yourself. With SQL, you'll have someone who may be quite right here, or at least work with you to help you achieve your goals. Uh, if you decide you want to implement something yourself, sorry, wouldn't you like to redo it that's easy to follow and designed specifically to be easy to modify instead of code or optimization if yours be the main design objective? Now, I should point out that while SQL is not focused on performance, it does remain competitive performance-wise with the other guys. And finally, and I think perhaps most importantly, you should use SQL for the same reason you use Ruby because it's more fun, or at least, it's less painful. Now, by now, I'm sure some of you are thinking, talk is cheap. Show me some code and let me judge for myself. So, let's drop the buzzer of crap and I write my code. <laughs> now, a good measure of the complexity of a good piece of software is the number of steps you have to take before you can start using it. Now, other than requiring a library, using SQL for the first time is like setting out on a long journey. It begins with only a single step. Now that step is creating your database object, and there's multiple ways to do this. One common way is using the connect method. SQL also provides methods for each adapter type. So if you are using SQLite, you just need to call the SQLite method with the file on the database. Now that's it. Once you have your database object, you can immediately use it to return results. Here, we're using the count method to get the number of attendees. <coughs> now SQL does not force you to create models if they don't help your application. If you are using models, SQL will return rows as a hash with symbol keys. And you can actually use SQL to return any type of object that you're choosing. Now, someone last month posted on the SQL mailing list that they had a database with thousands of tables with the same schema. Now, using Active Record, they have to use a metaprogram to create thousands of model classes, one for each table. With SQL, they could access the tables directly, which made their work a lot easier. Now, I certainly don't advocate that type of database design, but it does show you that SQL does have to handle degenerate cases more easily. Now, the convention when using SQL with a single database is to sort that database object in a constant name DB. Now, the database object is mainly used to create data sets, and it's also used to handle transactions instead of SQL logs, which I'll talk about now. Now, only way to use transactions with SQL is through the database object's transaction method. It takes a block and ensures that all database interaction inside the block uses the same database connection inside a database transaction. Now, this is necessary if you are making changes to the database and want to ensure that either all changes are made or no changes are made. Now, the example on the screen, you want to add an accounting entry to the database and update the account balance at the same time. Since we shouldn't be inserting an entry unless the account balance is updated, we use a database transaction to ensure that either all statements are successful or none are. Now, SQL loggers are useful for seeing SQL, what SQL and SQL is sending to the database, because SQL, or SQL extracts so much SQL code, you might not know what it's sending it unless you add an SQL logger. And you just access the array of database loggers to a database via the loggers method, and you add the loggers as you see fit. And every time a query is executed, the exact SQL use is logged at info level to all the database's loggers. Here, you run the all method on the activities data set, and it logs the SQL use to the standard output. Now, each database object has its own private connection pool, and SQL's use of the connection pool is designed for high concurrency, where SQL doesn't check out a connection from the pool until it is needed, and returns it to the pool as soon as it's no longer needed. And SQL's connection pool never requires the programmer to clean up connections manually, nor does it require a connection repo thread to clean up connections automatically. 
And let's go over quickly how to do four basic query types in SQL. Select queries are done using the all method to get all of the rows. You can also use the each method to iterate over the rows as the database method provides them. And you can use that to process a million record data sets at once, and depending on your adapter. Now, if you only want the first record, you can use the first method. Now, inserting rows is done with the insert method and hash of arguments, where the key specify columns and the values, the value for that column. And updating rows is similar, using the update method and hash similar insert. Update affects all rows in the data set, so if you use it on an unfiltered data set, it'll be updating all rows in the table. If you only want to update certain rows, you need to filter the data set first and then update it. Deleting rows, very similar, done using the delete method. It's like update, it affects all rows in the data set. So if you only want to delete certain rows, you should filter before deleting. Now I got a little ahead of myself. First, I need to explain the interesting little creature you see on the screen. This is the SQL data set, and it's what gives SQL a lot of its flexibility. A data set represents an SQL query, or more generally, an abstract set of objects. And at any point, you can take that abstract set and turn it into a concrete set by calling all. Now, as shown here, data sets are usually created by calling the array access operator on the database object with the symbol. Now, my friend the data set, he's got a baby goat. He doesn't think he can be improved. Let's say you want him to change, maybe by like calling filter, to restrict the rows he represents to a subset. He's going to pull a fast one on you by returning a data set that looks like him, but with the filter changed. Or the data set itself won't change. And if you ask that copy to change by calling limit, it's going to return another copy with both limit and filter apply. Now, this is known as a functional style API, where objects return modified copies of themselves. It's great, as it allows you to share data sets in multiple threads without worrying that those threads are modified shared state. Now, data sets have many methods that modify the query to change the SQL used. Now, pretty much any standard SQL clause has an associated method. We'll briefly review the most common methods. Select, change which columns are included in each return row, and in general, you get the best performance by selecting only the columns you'll actually be using. Filter reduces the rows to the included in the specified subset, and it's probably the most used method. Order changes the order in which you want rows returned. Often you want things in a chronological, alphabetic, numeric order, and this is the method you use. Limit, since it's an upper limit on the number of rows returned, you can also use it to specify an offset, and you can use limit with an offset to implement like a passionate search feature, which SQL's pagination extension does. Now there's a method for almost everything you can do in standard SQL. SQL is a very powerful language when it comes to dealing with sets of objects, and SQL gives you a simple interface to tap that power. Now, I mentioned earlier that SQL is SQL in Ruby, but so far I haven't given many examples. So I think I should rectify that. Um, here's a fairly simple query. You should know that a Ruby code doesn't contain any SQL. It uses Ruby symbols for SQL columns, and Ruby strings for SQL strings. Now, this is how most SQL code looks. Rarely do people write SQL manually, though SQL does support that too. Now, see how you use select to include the ID and name columns, filter to restrict the records to one where name is Jeremy, and or to also include records where page is true. You then order it by name and limit it to 10 records. Now, if you're used to SQL, it's pretty easy to translate code into SQL. And if you don't know SQL, learning SQL is probably easier than learning SQL. Now, here's a slightly more complicated example involving a joint. It shows that you can select all columns of a table using the symbol multiplication operator without an argument. Very similar to how you do so in SQL. It also shows how easy it is to join tables by specifying a table name and conditions. And you see how SQL assumes that the ID column is for the events table, and the event ID column is for the activities table. And finally, note how the bitwise operators on symbol operate as the logical operators in SQL. The ampersand is used as and, the pipe is or, and the tilde is not. All right, this is the last query. This one uses a filter with a block. Inside the block, instance methods without arguments, such as date, refer to SQL columns, and instance methods with arguments, such as date part, refer to SQL functions. The exclude method operates as an inverse filter, using a hash with the nil value, we generally set up the is null condition, using it with exclude, changes it to is not null. Finally, you can reference existing columns when setting new values, which is how the new value of price can depend on the existing price. And this is powerful, as it allows you to update prices for all filtered records at once, instead of retrieving all filtered records, determining what the new price should be, and updating each of them individually. And when possible, you should attempt to update multiple records in a single query, unless you have a good reason not to. Now, after looking at these examples, you might be thinking, 
what dark magic is simply using to support its DSL? And it's actually not that complicated. So you will add some methods to SQL and other four classes that are really easy to find. These methods create objects that SQL understands. For example, the numeric operators in SQL return instances of SQL, SQL, numeric expression. See so here I tax this numeric expression with the multiplication operator and arguments for price and 0.09. And numeric expressions also have the mathematical operators defined, which return other numeric expressions, which is what allows you to create complex queries. Numeric expressions also have the inequality methods defined, which yield Boolean expressions. And SQL has a basic understanding of the differences between numeric types and Boolean types at an SQL level. If it knows an object is Boolean in SQL, you can use the bitwise operators in place of the logical operators, which will produce other Boolean expression instances. And if it knows an object is Boolean, it's not going to let you use the mathematical operators, since they don't operate on Booleans in SQL. Now, while you're writing your complex SQL queries directly in Ruby, SQL is a Boolean sort of simple abstract syntax tree, which it compiles or literalizes when it comes time to generate the SQL. The display here is an only slightly simplified abstract syntax tree for the allowed object. Now, knowing about SQL at an object level instead of at a string level allows SQL to have quite powerful introspection capabilities. One instance where SQL manifests this knowledge so when it comes time to invert existing conditions. Other database libraries would only, that only understand SQL at a string level would probably just stick a not in front of the conditions. And SQL, because it understands SQL at an object level, can actually apply the inversion operator to the abstract syntax tree based on the rules of logic. It changes the AND to an OR, the NOT coupon to a coupon, and the greater than or equal to a less than. The final result is clearer looking SQL. It's easier to understand. A row is not allowed if its price, including tax, is less than 25, or if the coupon was used. And just to prove that the inversion operator works, we can invert the object twice, which leaves us with the SQL we started with. Now, I mentioned earlier that SQL code is very concise. Now, one of the tricks SQL uses to keep code concise is it allows you to use a single symbol to contain both the table and the column by separating them with a double underscore. It also allows you a single symbol to contain both a column and an alias by separating them with a triple underscore, and it allows you to combine the two approaches by using both a double underscore and a triple underscore in the same symbol. Now, if you want to ask, or specify custom SQL, you can do so by calling the array access operator on the database object with a string. Now, using the array access operator on the database object combined with short but intuitive method names is one reason that SQL code almost always ends up being more concise than code using another way Ruby database library. Now, so far, I've only talked about so-called core SQL. And SQL is actually split into two parts, SQL core and SQL model. And SQL model is just an object relational mapper built on top of SQL core. Model classes are backed by core datasets, so you have all the power of core SQL when using models. Now, the basics of SQL model are similar to other Ruby ORMs. One thing that differentiates SQL model is it's very powerful and flexible associations. In keeping with the toolkit approach, SQL only supports the three most common association types natively. However, it allows you to build your own custom associations and even supports the equal loading of custom associations. Now, one example of an association type that doesn't support natively is active reference has many, through has many association. And this association can easily be built using SQL's toolkit. The key is the dataset option, which allows you to specify the dataset to use for the association. In this example, each firm has many clients, and each client has many databases, with many, many invoices. To get the invoices for the firm, you load all invoices for the client's firm is the current firm. Now, the eagle graph method eagerly loads the clients for each firm, so you also get the benefit of each client object for each invoice being cached in the return invoices. And you can create custom associations in active record, but you need to write all the SQL by hand. Now, that's painful enough, but what's worse is you can't eagerly load custom associations in active record. SQL gives you that ability using the equal loader association option. This option is a product that takes three arguments, the key hash, an array of current objects, and the dependent associations to equally load. Now the key hash is just an optimization. It's a hash of hashes with keys or columns, such as ID, and the values are subhashes. The subhashes have keys which are the, are the values of that column, such as one or two, and the values, which are an array of instances which have the related value for that column. So, in the example above, firm 1 has ID 1, and firm 2 has ID 2. And in this case, since the association depends on the firm's primary key, 
We only care about that specific subhash, which we assign to the local variable IP map. And for each firm the data set we were doing remoting, we first set the cache to invoices association to the empty array. Then we get all invoices for all clients of all the firms in the data set using the keys of the IP map. And for each of these invoices, we associate it back to the related firm using the values of the IP map for the invoices client's firm ID, adding it to the existing array of invoices. Now, after we were finished processing all the invoices, each firm will have all related invoices in the association cache. So calling the invoices method on any firm object return will not cause any additional database queries. And you should know that there's nothing inherently specific about this approach. Creating a generic plugin that supports any hazmat or hazmat association is possible and probably not even all that complex. There's already a plugin that does something similar for polymorphic associations using basically the techniques I've explained. Now, in addition to advanced features that aren't shared by the Ruby ORMs, SQL supports the most common ORM features. It has hooks and validations, association callbacks and extensions, and supports two separate even loading implementations, one of which uses joins, and another which loads in each association and separate query. The SQL is a toolkit, so it gives the programmer a choice which eager loading implementation to use, rather than guessing. Like uh, Aaron mentioned, the ambiguity <coughs> is evil. So, like, like SQL Core, SQL Model is incredibly flexible. It's built completely out of plugins. The most basic <coughs> model functionality is a plugin, and the associations implementation is also a plugin. SQL ships with seven other optional plugins, which add support to things like caching, single table inheritance, and serialization. Our plugins can modify any aspect of SQL model. They can override any class, instance, or dataset method, and can call super to get the default behavior. I don't have that much time left, but I thought I should mention some other advantages that SQL brings to the table. 13. That's the number of database adapters that SQL currently supports. And by comparison, Active Record officially only supports four adapters, and Ruby DBI officially supports five. Now, the only database that that's supported by the other guys that SQL doesn't support is SQLite 2, and that's only because it was so old that it wasn't even common use when SQL was originally developed. Now, one reason SQL supports so many adapters is adapters are easy to write, only five methods are required, and the shortest adapter is only around 50 lines. Now, SQL has a possibly unique feature called dataset graphing, and to explain the benefits, I first need to quickly explain the problem it solves. And that problem is joint clobbering, since SQL returns rows as hashes, if multiple tables have the same column names, and you don't alias the columns manually, columns in the join tables end up clobbering columns in the original table. In this example, both attendees and events have ID and name columns. However, when you join them and get results, the columns from the events table end up clobbering columns from the attendees table. Now, graphing fixes the situation by returning rows as a hash with table name symbol keys and subhash values, where the subhashes have columns, the column keys, and values being values for those related columns. Now it does this by aliasing all columns for you and splitting the single hash results into subhashes when the rows are retrieved before returning them to you. Now see here how you get the activities columns in the activities subhash and the events columns in the events subhash. The graphing makes it much easier to deal with database relationships at a row-based level. Now SQL supports creating and altering tables as well as most other forms of schema modifications, which you can use both inside of and outside of migrations. SQL supports both bound variables and prepared statements, with native support on four separate adapters and emulated support on, on all the others. SQL supports database store procedures for MySQL and JDBC adapters, and SQL supports both master store database configurations and shell configurations. Now, finally, I mentioned earlier that there's a natural human reaction, reaction to resist change. Let's say you have an existing active record infrastructure that would be tedious and time consuming to change. How would you like to be able to use SQL's powerful filtering and easy DSL while keeping all of your current active record behavior? And you can actually do this in a single line of SQL, that I've broken into multiple lines here. You just need to add a row proc to the data set that changes the hash from simple keys to string keys and calls the active record private class method to instantiate with the hash. And that's all it takes, and then your data set will return active record instances. Uh, that ends the slideshow part of my talk. Um, for my reading time, I'm going to do some live coding, showing some features to SQL, hopefully with some audience participation. As you see, I'm doing this presentation on Windows, which makes me either brave or stupid. Uh, let's assume I'm brave, I'm doing it to show that if you're one of the unfortunate souls forced to use Windows, you can still leave SQL to accomplish your goals.
it's a really old machine, I'm sorry. I'm running Open Office 3 on this machine, and it's, it takes a long time to get everything. question, yeah. Um, is there, I mean you mentioned it in the last slide a little bit, is there, um, what's, your, what's your, your vision of the future of SQL and its coexistence with Active Record? Um, personally I don't use, I'm mostly all, as you would expect, using all SQL. I can really give it up as an example of how powerful SQL is in terms of being flexible, but using a row clock with a SQL data set, you can get it to return any type of logic you want. Um, so I expect Active Record because that's the most common one you all run. Um, but if you want to return other types of models or basically any object you want, you just need, the row clock takes the, the hash that SQL produces, and in most cases you just you know, return a different type of object with it. So you can use it to return active record instances, but it's not limited to that. It's, it's really flexible in terms of you can do whatever, you can use it in whichever way suits you best. Does that answer your question or? Well, I was just curious if you had a vision for it, like, do you want this to be part of the next Rails release or down the road, or have you talked to those guys, or where do you see, see it going? I don't know. I, I have no idea. I would assume that if you like SQL and wanted to use it, you probably want to um, use SQL model as well. I mean, SQL model is just like SQL. I think it's, I, I think it's a good active record in most instances. I mean, the one thing that active record has that SQL doesn't have that I think really is a good idea it has a little more powerful schema support in terms of taking an existing schema and being able to create like migrations that will create your schema. Sort of taking it from SQL and bringing it in a Ruby form. And SQL doesn't really have that currently. Um, so that's one of the nice But other than that, I think SQL is a better choice. But if, first, if you do have a lot of active record infrastructure you, you can't change or don't want to change, you can use SQL and still return active record instances. So you still have all your instance level behavior. But you have all, one of the main, Draws of SQL is that filtering um, is just so powerful and easy to use and flexible that people might want to still use that while keeping all their effort and behavior and not changing it. Go ahead. So SQL, it looks, it's crazy awesome and it's, it's supporting all this different database adapters and all, like, all these crazy things. It seems like you must be using this all the time. So, like, in what context did you develop this, and like, how do you how do you maintain compatibility mode? Um, I actually did. I'm the original developer of the SQL. I actually took it over after only been using it for about a month. Um, the original developer was a guy named Sharon Rosner. Um, he basically uh, decided to give up programming altogether. Not sure what he did, but I uh, gave it up. I was I submitted a patch um, that went into SQL 1.3. Shortly after that, I decided to not program anymore. Uh, you know, like four developers of SQL say, if you want to take it over, you can. Um, I was one of two developers that responded, and the other person didn't have enough time, so I just, they just, I didn't even really look at SQL's code base, um, was most of it, until after I became a team. And uh, if you look at my mountain list talk, uh, which I gave last month, it goes into a lot more detail. Um, it's very, very code heavy. You know, I almost have to pause it every few seconds to read my slides. Um, but it sort of goes into that. Um, so, I can't really take credit for a lot of what's in SQL. I, I've, I've, been, I've had a lot, a lot of improvements to it. But basically, the basic design was sort of well, already there. So, does that answer? How do you test it, though? I mean, how do you... Oh, how do I test it? Um, there's also, there's, there, there, one thing that SQL did have is a fairly expensive test suite when I started, um, with fairly good code coverage. Um, so that, that was extremely helpful in terms of changing things without breaking things. Um, another, uh, Thing is, I added an integration test suite. So originally, SQL's tests were, didn't use a database at all, which is weird for a database library. Um, it basically tested the SQL that was being produced, um, used a lot of mocks. Um, it, that, it, was, it was really good, but it had some problems because um, some things are so, so tight in database interaction. So I, I, added, I added an integration test suite where you basically put in a live adapter and you can test it against a live database to test basic model, um, or did basic data set functionality. And that's been really helpful in terms of getting around some corner case bugs and stuff. So mainly just unit tests are, are the ones that manage to keep SQL's code quality high. 
Um, another thing is, unlike some other Ruby database libraries, SQL's master branch is pretty much almost always more stable than, than the latest release because almost every patch that goes into SQL, at least before I push it to GitHub, gets tested by the push the full test framework that I use for the releases. So it's pretty stable to, to, to use it in, in production. Any other questions? Go ahead. How do you handle exceptions? Uh, uh, As a SQL error, so you can you, you, if you write your application code to catch SQL database error, and you have Postgres and it raises PG error, it converts it for you, so you can use a single um, exception class to basically handle all sort of database problems. And not all adapters support that, but um, the most the three most common ones: SQLite, MySQL, Postgres, I think also JDBC, all do that.